Good morning, and welcome to the Butter Valley Community Church gathering and service this morning, whether you are gathering with us here in the sanctuary or in the fellowship hall or watching online uh, in our streaming or YouTube, we welcome you. I am Pastor Bob Gerhardt. I am not Pastor Mark Hager. Pastor Mark is and his family are under quarantine uh, this week. They are doing well. They're not sick, and as you might think of them as being sick, but because uh, Cassie tested positive, uh, they are under quarantine for a few more days. So I am delighted to be able to fill in, uh, perhaps not only delighted, but terrified. Uh, it's been a long time, and I am a bit rusty at this. When I was a uh, pastor here in the olden days, before masks and before separation and social distancing, our church was called the Hereford Mennonite Church. But uh, we're delighted for how God has worked in the life of the congregation, bringing Pastor Mark to our congregation and the leadership that he has been providing. But I will be continuing this morning in the series that he's been preaching on through the book of Isaiah as we look at a passage from Isaiah chapter 8. In the way of announcements, um, there are a number of things that you need to be aware of. Many of these are in the bulletin. But first of all, the Sunday school will not resume until February. So there will not be Sunday school gatherings during the month of January. There is youth group tonight meet, uh, meeting at 6.30 uh, to 8.30 over at the Bally Community Center for those of you in the youth group. Um, please, for all of you that are here in the building, uh, go to your church mailboxes afterwards and pick up all those Christmas cards that you didn't get if you uh, missed uh, last week. Uh, a number of cards have been placed in the mailboxes, and since we didn't have our Christmas Eve uh, gathering in quite the same way as many of you were anticipating, uh, you might not have picked up your Christmas mail. But in addition to that are the new giving envelopes for giving uh, your regular church giving during the coming year are in the mailboxes. Today for the offering and the giving, uh, it's not only the last Sunday of the year uh, for your year-end giving, but it's also an opportunity to give to the White Gift Projects, and those are listed in the bulletin. Uh, there are... Uh, Three projects this year, Camp Menelan, uh, Cure International, and then assisting a number of our missionary families that are making a move in the coming year. The other announcements, I think, are, are in the bulletin. Um, I unless I'm missing one, uh, there will be children's church today for grades K through tw uh, to grade two. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord God, as we've come into your presence, whether we're here in the same building or whether we're in our homes and linked by technology, we thank you that we can come to worship, to come to adore you, because you came to us. You came to us taking on human flesh, being born, Lord Jesus, as a baby, laying in a manger in Bethlehem, and then growing up in sinless perfection to be Savior, Redeemer, Messiah, and Lord. Lord Jesus, we gather in your name, asking that your spirit would move in our hearts and our minds, open our understanding of your word. We ask that you would accept our expressions of praise and gratitude as we sing together. And Lord, as we give and yield our lives to you, may you be glorified. May your purposes for us be carried out, not in our strength, 
but in your great provision. And we pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. singing. Seize their trouble. 
This morning, our reading of scripture is from Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, we will be reading verses 11 uh, to 22. And uh, in, in the church bulletin, there is the uh, printed uh, verses. Let's read, pay, uh, give attention to God's word as I read it with you. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. The Lord Almighty, uh, he is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken, they will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from, from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When people tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the, to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. And then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. May the Lord challenge us with his word. The children are dismissed for children's church at this time. In the series that Pastor Mark has been leading us through in the book of Isaiah, we had jumped ahead to chapter 9. We're coming back to this passage, which he skipped, not uh, by mistake, but uh, with the design for relating the messages to the Advent season. But certainly coming back to this last section of Isaiah 8 is extremely timely, not just for this Christmas season. And by the way, Christmas did not end on Friday at midnight, okay? That might have been Christmas Day, but in terms of observing the, the incarnation, the birth of Christ, and the events that took place, it should be celebrated by Christians for a period of time yet. 
And traditionally, we have the 12 days of Christmas leading up to what is called Epiphany, the, the appearance, the lighting, uh, bringing light into darkness, uh, especially with the visit of the wise men, of the Gentiles who came to present gifts to this newborn Messiah. But in between, we have Jesus being taken to the temple uh, on the eighth day and being presented to uh, the, the Lord on behalf of, of Mary, his mother, and his, the one who will be serving as his father here on earth, Joseph, Mary's husband, but not Jesus' biological father. And so we have that old man there in the temple, Simon, recognizing this infant is none other than the one he's been waiting for, the Messiah who has been born. And then Anna, the, the elderly prophetess, 84 years old, and she's been a widow ever since uh, her husband died after only seven years of marriage. And she's been serving the Lord in the temple as a prayer intercessor, as one who is worshiping God on a daily basis. And she recognizes that here is this infant that has been promised. This one that will be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So keep your Christmas going. Don't stop listening to the carols. Now there are a couple other Christmas songs, secular things that you can skip those from now on. But, <laughs> but stay with the good news that Christ has been born. But looking at Isaiah 8, I mean, how timely can it be when Isaiah, 700 years before Christ is born, is describing 2020 uh, to a T. The Lord said to me, in fact, Isaiah says in verse 11, the Lord grabbed hold of me. He took me maybe by the arm, probably by the shoulder. Maybe even in the way that some of you Dads used to discipline your kids when they were starting to get richy in church and you reach over and you just put your arm around them and take hold of the far shoulder and just start squeezing until they catch on that they're supposed to be quiet. But whatever Isaiah had in mind, he's saying, God, God got a hold of me. He, he wanted to get my attention. He put his arm around me in power and strength, not just in, in tenderness. But he spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, and he warned me to not follow the way of this people, the people of, of Israel, the people of Judah, the people that uh, are God's chosen people, aren't they? The people that have a temple there in Jerusalem, a people that have the scriptures, but he's saying, don't follow the way they are living, the way they are thinking, the way they are conducting themselves, for they are neglecting me, the Lord is saying, and they are neglecting my word, and they are missing the whole point of, of what my temple is here for. And Isaiah said, the Lord specifically said to me, he said, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. How many conspiracies have been going on in the last 10, 11 months? Is COVID, was that? released by the Chinese Communist Party from a lab intentionally to contaminate the world? Uh, are some of those remedies that worked uh, being squelched because pharmaceutical companies can't make money on them, but they will make money on the vaccine, but you're going to get the vaccine free because you're not, you know, only the government is going to pay for it. Guess where they got their money? Uh, <laughs> All of these conspiracies, theories, the elections, 
What happened? What is happening? What's going to happen? What's going on in the world of finance? Who's pulling the strings? Who's controlling your media? Why are some things no longer appearing on your Facebook accounts or as Twitter or as Messenger? You post something and then it comes up, there's another little message that this is not true or the fact finders are, or there are others who, and who's behind all of that? There's conspiracy after conspiracy. And then you have the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, what kind of conspiracy has been going on to destroy their reputation and, and their outcome, and uh, let alone the Phillies? I mean, look at what happened to their season. We can live speculating, jumping on all kinds of movements and bandwagons and ideas, and we can become very much in, enthralled with one conspiracy being better than another conspiracy, or uh, I know which conspiracies are true. You, you might not, but I could tell you which ones are actually factual, and although somebody would say that, no, I'm totally wrong, or I missed it on this one. But Isaiah was living in this kind of a, a setting, this kind of a culture. There were political movements going on, King Ahaz had made a mess of things. And, you know, the Assyrians were threatening the north and, and then they were going to be threatening the south. And, and Judah thought, well, if we can make an alliance here, if we can get these guys together, uh, we can counteract this. And, and they had all kinds of political strategies going on, actual conspiracies going on making alliances. Now, if you notice, there is a footnote as to what that word conspiracy might mean. And um, it, it can, in, in some Bibles, it, it talks about alliances. Others talk about treaties, uh, arrangements that, uh, in the King James, it uses the word confederacy which is a, an older way of <clears throat> talking about a conspiracy <clears throat> which changed its meaning because of our civil war and, and how the word confederate uh, became, had a different meaning than it, it would have meant in 1611 when the King James Bible was translated. But it's a little bit of a nebulous idea as to what is actually going on here. We think of conspiracies as a very bad negative thing. But we would think of a, making a treaty as a good thing uh, or forming an alliance. And Isaiah is saying, well, these are not always good. When you are forming an alliance with those who do not believe what you believe, who's going to be compromising their convictions? When you enter into a treaty in which you promise to protect this nation if they're attacked uh, by their enemy, uh, what, if, what if they do something stupid and bring on that attack, but you already have a treaty arrangement? And by the way, that has happened in our world history over and over again. When we have had treaties that because somebody got involved in a war, the rest had to follow because of their commitment that they had made. And, and there will be those who will take advantage of that in a conspiratorial sort of way. So what does this have to do with us today other than who's ever going to find out who really is behind certain situations and we'll need to wait until the outcome, and then you look back and say, aha, now I see who made the stupid mistake or who believed the wrong thing. It's hard to, it's hard to see ahead from our limited view. What we really need is to know 
who knows what's going on overall? And there's only one, and it's God, the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who is sovereign over nations, the one who has created mankind, but also understands fully the fall and the ruin of man's soul and mind and heart when he allowed sin to dominate, when he gave in and rebelled against his creator and believed a lie instead of truth. God wasn't taken by surprise. God still is God. He was not defeated. He is still the Lord Almighty. And so Jeremiah is being reminded by God do not be afraid of what other people are afraid of. Do not fear what they fear. These people that think we better arrange some manipulation of, of our culture, some way of, of keeping the enemy at bay, some way of, of gaining the victory, even if it means we have to cheat a bit here or have to exercise uh, unjust power here. We, we need to take into our own hands the control of and manipulation of our, of our times. And God is saying, don't, don't be afraid of what these people are fearing. Don't, don't dread what they dread. But he doesn't say, oh, just relax. Don't worry. Be happy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there is something to fear and there is someone to dread, but it's not the king, it's not the politician, it's not the media, it's not your relative, it's not your neighbor, it's not these people that you think are up to no good and, and you're totally subject to their whims and their powers. There is someone who is greater than your enemy. There is greater than your society, than your culture. There is the Lord God Almighty. And so in verse 13, he says, The Lord Almighty is the one that you are to regard as holy. He's different than everything else in this creation. He is, some translations imply that he is the one that you are to consecrate, set apart from what you think of politicians, what you think of media, what you think of, of Hollywood or, or the celebrities or, or the financial pictures of, that are controlling the world. There is a God who is almighty. He is the one you are to regard as separate from all the rest, as holy, as perfect. He is the one you are to fear. And he is the one you are to dread. If there's anybody that should make you quiver because they are greater than, than your mind can comprehend, it should be the Lord, not somebody on, on the media or somebody that's controlling, uh, the th trying to influence your thinking, trying to scare you into, into action or into inaction, there is one that we are to respect, to fear, to dread, and that is the Lord God. Now, in the NIV, which we're reading, it says the Lord Almighty. The Lord is all spelled in capital letters. That, that's the Lord Jehovah, the Lord Yahweh, the Lord who says, I am that I am. But the word almighty is being used, some translations will have the Lord of hosts. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We don't talk about the hosts in our world in the way that it would have been used several centuries ago in English. Some of you and some of your family have served in the hosts. The idea of the hosts 
These are the armies. This is the military. But not the military here on earth now. The Lord of hosts, he is the Lord of the armies of heaven. He is the Lord, not of little angels who look like little cherubs and sort of fat little guys with wings. He is the Lord of the multitudes, the millions of created angelic beings who are powerful, almighty. And they are at the Lord's beck and command. He sent a batch of them to scare the wits out of some shepherds. Well, he didn't do it to scare them, but to show that he has glory and power and might, and his angelic beings appeared and they sang glory to God, not glory to themselves. But these, that was just a portion. When you read the book of Revelation, you see the, that they can't be numbered. They, these angelic beings are powerful and they will conquer. They will win as they're directed by the Lord himself. For the Lord God is the Lord of hosts. Martin Luther captured that when he wrote, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. In his second verse, it says, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask, doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. And then there's this phrase that a lot of people sing and don't know what it means. Lord Sabaoth, his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And maybe you think like I used to think as a kid when we sang this hymn. Oh, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's in charge of Sundays or Saturdays. Uh, no, it's not Sabbath, it's Sabaoth. That's the word for the hosts, the armies of heaven. And Luther is saying, Jesus Christ is the one who is the Lord of these angels. He is the Lord of all the spiritual forces for good. All of that which will conquer evil as his agents. Now, Jesus himself is the Savior. The angels are not our saviors. We don't worship angels. We don't bow down to angels. We don't have to have an angel sitting on our shoulder to, to you know, keep us straight. But God does protect you with angelic force and being. And he will bring about the final judgment on this earth and on this universe using the agency of his armies of heaven. That God, and Luther identifies him with the name Christ Jesus. It is he who is this Lord Almighty. Now, that doesn't cancel out the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We, we have one God, triune God, but three persons. But Jesus is the Lord Almighty. Jesus, along with the Father, has all power. And he told his disciples that when he gave them the Great Commission, that the Father had committed to him all power, all authority on, in heaven and on earth. So when he says, now go, and take this good news to the nations. He's in charge. And he can send us with any protection and guidance that we need. Both through the Holy Spirit, but protecting with the armies of heaven. And so Isaiah is being told by the Lord, don't fear what your neighbors are fearing. Don't be dread what everybody's dreading when they watch the evening news. Maybe the best thing is to just turn it off and, and, and imagine your own dread. But <laughs> the Lord is the one who is to be respected. The Lord is the one who is to be feared. The Lord is the one before whom we stand in awe 
And we realized when, if he has that much power, that much authority, why should I be afraid of what's going on around me? I can trust him. Now, he's going to be your sanctuary. He's going to be your refuge, your protection. And, and he's available to all who will trust him. But the prophecy here, Isaiah is told, but Israel, the north, and Judah, the south, are both going to miss it. They're going to fall flat on their faces. They're going to stumble over this good news of who God is and what God has come to do. That while this Lord Almighty is the one to be regarded as holy, the people are stumbling over a rock that makes them fall. The rock that should be their foundation, they're not looking for to build their lives on it. They're trying to get beyond past him. And he's in the way. And they stumble and trip over him. Uh, in the King James, there's a word that shows up here that uh, the word, he, it is a jinn, G-I-N. A jinn and uh, a, stum, a snare. Now, what is a jinn? Well, uh, it's not the drink. Okay, that's made with juniper berries. It, it's a little trap. It was a trap that was used to, to catch songbirds. Uh, not, not big animals, but a little trap that could be overlooked very easily. But when Whitney decided to figure out a way to get the little seeds out of the bowls of cotton, he invented a, a machine that would trap those little seeds, and he called it the cotton gin. G-I-N. It's that same word that's here. Our translation simply says a trap and a snare. For big problems and for tiny little problems. But people are falling over and tripping over Jesus Christ. They're missing it. They're thinking he was a, a good teacher, but uh, why would I trust someone who lived 2,000 years ago? They miss the fact that he's raised from the dead, that he is now the Lord Almighty. Read the description of what he looks like now in Revelation chapter 1. When his best friend John saw him on the throne, he fell down and before him and realized that this one that he used to lean against at the, Lord, at the Last Supper is none other then the Lord of hosts seated on the throne with all of the glory and power and authority of heaven. Isaiah is told in verse 16, this good news, wrap it up, bind it, make sure that you don't lose it, tie it, uh, bind up this testimony and, and make sure that the authoritative seal that this is true, this is the valid document Seal it up among my disciples. For those who are following me, don't let them forget the law and the prophets, the law and the testimony, the law and the truth. And so David, or David, uh, Isaiah here says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Some translation says, I will wait with hope. I will be looking for him. I will be longing for him. What is trust? Trust is that firm belief that, that this fact is true, that it can be relied on, the reliability of truth of either someone or something that that this person can be trusted or I can, I can put stake my life on, on the validity of, of this ladder. It's not going to collapse. I'm trusting it. Uh, I, 
I'm believing that it will hold together. When you sat down this morning, you, you had confidence in, in the church pew or the church seat uh, that it would not collapse. You, you were trusting it. You had a confidence. You were relying on it. And you can rest on that. You can rest your mind on the fact that some things are true and are still true and will always be true. And can be, you can build your life. You can stake your eternal existence on it. That is the kind of trust that Isaiah is saying, I will make my own. I will choose to trust in this Lord, in this one who is almighty. This one, yes, there are times my reaction to him will be one of a proper fear. He's greater than I am. I can't push him around. I can't argue with him. He's one that, that I need to realize that he is so holy that my sinful condition, I must dread coming to him as though everything's okay. I need to come with repentance. I need to come with sorrow about my sinful condition and seek his forgiveness, which he offers to me. But he is the Lord, almighty, not partly mighty. I will put my trust in him. And he ends up with a section that we could spend a lot of time on, but he's saying, don't turn to magic. Don't turn to soothsayers. Don't turn to the, the, the necromancers, those who can get in touch with the departed spirits of the dead and look to them for answers. Don't do it. It's forbidden by scripture. It's forbidden in the law in Deuteronomy 18. They are not to put their trust in those who are manipulating the spirit world. Fortune tellers, magicians in the sense of a true magician, not the illusionist who plays tricks on your eyes. The, those who, who try to bring truth from secrets that only they had access to. Look how he says this. When men tell you to consult the mediums, the go-betweens between the spirit world and your world, the spiritist, those who whisper and mutter, should not a people, instead of doing that, inquire of one who is over all the spirit world, who is going to capture, uh, keep capture, uh, captive those evil spirits, and he, he will bind them. He's the one who will cast Satan into the bottomless pit. He's the one who distinguishes between the angels who are righteous and those angels who are demonic, the evil spirits that are opposed to God. Why would you consult the enemies of God to find peace and truth and hope? Don't put your confidence in those who say they have secret solutions for the conspiracies of the world. Those who who can go beyond the material world and, and, and give you spiritual powers and unleash the powers in the crystals or in the constellations, in, in the zodiac, and, and they can predict your future and, and help you to make those wise choices through astrology. Those things, Isaiah says, they're off limits. They're out of bounds. You're dealing with a God who's making himself known and he's not lying to you. Don't go to the spirits who, who will lie to you. To the law, to the testimony. Basically, he's saying, go back to the scriptures. Go to the word of God and follow it. If somebody does not speak according to the word of God, they have no light for your path. No light of the dawn. Instead, they will be distressed, hungry. They'll roam through the land. When they're famished, when they're spiritually empty, they will become enraged. They will look upward and curse. 
their king. They will curse their God. They will curse all authorities that are over them, all that would try to guide their life into a right way. They'll rebel against it. And then they will look down toward the earth and they'll find only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Why would you want to go into a dark world when you have the God who created light as your God, as the Almighty One that you can trust? Choose to trust Him. He is trustworthy. Don't choose the alternatives that Satan would bring into your life as other options that might give you a great feeling that you've made a discovery that nobody else knows, but it's a discovery of darkness. It will lead to despair. Now, in the Jewish Bible, chapter 8 doesn't end there. What we call chapter 9 and verse 1, the Hebrews Bible says that's still the last verse of chapter 8. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan, that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And he goes on then to describe the birth of the Messiah, the one who is the light of the world the one who is the truth and the way and the life that in whom we can place our confidence now and forever. The Lord God, the Almighty, the Lord Sabaoth, Jesus is his name. Trust him. Choose to trust him. He will never let you down. Let's pray. Lord God, in looking at some of the insights and facts that you have included in this passage of Scripture. There's so much more there in applying to our individual lives. Guide us now by your Spirit to make those applications that are fitting in whatever situation we're facing. Keep us from the fears that the world would impose and the dreads that would be unnecessary when we trust you instead. And may we choose to trust you wholeheartedly, with joy, walking in the light that you have brought into this dark world. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise and worship.
For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, thick darkness over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Those are the words Isaiah wrote later about that Messiah who was born. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 